Good afternoon. Welcome to this second part. The question I want to answer is, what is spiritualism? Now let's read what Ellen White has to say. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. The foundation of his work was laid by the assurance given to Eve in Eden. You shall not surely die. In the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Little by little he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. Now what's the foundation of spiritualism? It is, it was laid in Eden. Spiritualism is when the devil speaks. <laughs> That's spiritualism. But what did he say? He implied that even if Eve came away from God and sinned, she would be still immortal and divine. Right? And this had set the foundation, the false foundation for virtually all religion, the immortal soul. It's in Buddhism, Hinduism, it's in Zen, yeah? it's in Christianity to a large extent. Right? Now, I want to show you what Dr. Carl Jung said about Abraxas. Now, Carl Jung, in his field of work, he understands the human psyche, generally. He sees man as inventing or creating myths and demons and gods to represent what he feels and what he thinks, his psyche. And he talked about, Carl Jung talked about Abraxas. And I'll read what he said. That which is spoken by God, the Son, is life. That which is spoken by the devil is death. But Abraxas speaketh that hallowed and accursed word, which is life and death at the same time. Abraxas begetteth truth and lying, good and evil, light and darkness, in the same word and in the same act. Wherefore, Abraxas is terrible. Now, Abraxas represents, is a representation of man's God in relation to all non-dual thinking. Right? Because Abraxas is life and death at the same time, lying and truth at the same time. He's a non-dual God. That's who he is. And this non-duality uh, that we have an immortal soul and that we ought to meditate or contemplate, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of authors promoting this. And a whole lot of them, hundreds of them, are Christians, Protestants and Catholics. And you can go into the web a website called Lighthouse Trails and you can look for this and there will be list of hundreds. Time magazine looks at this as the mindful revolution. Goldman Sachs, because one of the directors, William George, is a meditator, he introduced it into Goldman Sachs, the top bank. And the queue to do meditation in Goldman Sachs cannot be met. It's more than a year long. At Davos G20, the most recent one. Right? The top 20 nations in the world, they are leaders. They were taught meditation by Goldie Hawn and Ricard Mathieu, a French monk. So what is spiritualism? In the great controversy, Alan White writes, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, and the former being the immortality of the soul. The latter, Sunday, creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach across the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. Now she makes a distinction, I think, to grasp spiritualism. That is the foundation. That's where the strength is. They will hang on to it. 
that's grasping. Then they will clasp hands, shake hands. That's their bond of sympathy. Right? So we can look for this events happening. And it's happening. We see a, uni a, a movement, a unity movement now between Catholics and Protestants. Now, we must never think of it as twofold because it's a threefold union. And spiritualism is the chief and third component. That's how we should think. Now, the second angel's message, and we should know it well, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, what is this wine? What did Ellen White say? She said, The wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath which the Lord Jehovah hath blessed and sanctified for the use of man. And the pagan teaching of the immortality of the soul. And she adds, These and kindred heresies. Now, what are these? These are, number one, the spurious Sabbath. And two, the immortality of the soul. These, she said, and kindred heresies, a whole lot of them. And the rejection of the truth convert the church into Babylon. Now, we may think of the wine of Babylon, and we often think of the wine of Babylon as this confusion, this heresies, this kindred heresies. But think about this. The foundation is the immortality of the soul. Right? The very foundation. It was the foundation that created the confusion. The, 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 the thought that, hey, Eve, come over. Sin, and you are still divine and immortal. That we are a non-dual being of fallen human and divinity. That causes confusion and his, has led to the development of kindred heresies. So the foundation, as you can see in these words, is the immortality of the soul. Sunday is a bond of sympathy, a handshake, a clasping of hands. Now, I want to introduce this man to you. His name is Thomas Merton. I'm going to read these slides. And as I read, think about what he's saying and contrast it with what Satan said in Eden and see if you can see the similarities. All right? <clears throat> he says, at the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and by illusion, a point of pure truth, a point of spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, from which God disposes of our lives, which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. Because when you die, that is all that is left. When we die, everything is destroyed except this one thing which is our reality that God preserves for ever. He will not permit its final destruction. And the thing is that we know this. This is built into that particular, particular little grain of gold, the spark of the soul, or whatever it is. It knows this. And the freedom that matters is the capacity to be in contact with that center. For it is from that center that everything else comes. Contemplative prayer is nothing other than coming into consciousness of what is already there. Now, Thomas Merton is the founder of Catholic Contemplative Prayer. And this is what he said. Now, question, as we contrast it with what Satan said in Eden. Did Father Thomas Merton say, you shall not surely die? And that you're divine? Yes. He said, you've got this spark. It will not die. God will not allow it to die. Did he say, your eyes will be open? He said that right here. He said, contemplative prayer is nothing other than coming into consciousness. That's a code word for meditators. Coming into consciousness. Your eyes will be open. Did he say you will be as gods? Yes, divine. So divine <laughs> that even if you sin, your divinity is untouched by sin. Did he say, 
you shall know good and evil. Ah, or mingling, non-dual good and evil. Yeah. He said, your freedom is, the, the freedom that matters is the capacity to be in contact with this center. That even if you sin, your center remains untouched by sin. That's non-dual. Right? It's a mingling of good and evil. Now, who is Father Thomas Murphy? I will, and what position does he hold in the Catholic Church? I will get into that later. Now, Pope Francis went to the U.S. Congress in September and delivered a speech. And in that speech, he held up Father Thomas Merton as a man who will bring, whose contemplative style, he said, will bring peace and unity to all people and religion. He held up four men. He held up... Um, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, a, a, a Catholic activist, and he said he held up Father Thomas Merton. But he said, he focused on Father Thomas Merton and said, look at his contemplative style. Okay? And furthermore, he said, to bring peace and unity to people and religion, we must not differentiate. It's too simplistic. He said, so it's, too, it's simplistic reductionism to look at people and say good and evil. It's too simplistic to say sinner and righteous. And he said, we must confront all polar opposites. <laughs> How do you confront opposites? Through the contemplative style of Father Thomas Merton. So here was the Pope delivering a spiritualistic message and Congress applauded. So here is spiritualism at the very highest of places. It's a very sophisticated spiritualism. If we, Ellen White said this, <clears throat> the people who are uncaring, undifferentiating how they live, how they eat, what they eat, when they sleep, what they watch, they are sp practicing spiritualism. But it's a crude form. But here, what we're seeing, the non-dual form, is the form of that unites leaders. This is the enlightened form and the most dangerous form. But you have a whole spectrum. You've got the crude form, you've got the high-minded form, and you've got everything in, in between. Exercises, mindfulness therapy, <laughs> tai chi, huh? philosophy, and you've got this whole spectrum. So our world is immersed in non-dualism. That's how dangerous it is right now. And the day before, Pope Francis spoke at the United Nations. And after he spoke, they honored him with a song. Shakira sang him a song. And the song was John Lennon's song, 40 years ago. Imagine there's no heaven. And the lyrics go, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. And so forth and so forth. And no religion too. And the world will live as one. Now this is a non-dual song. And it came out when the Beatles were meditating with Maharishi Guru. Transcendental meditation. Now I was there 40 years ago. <laughs> this was what turned me on. This was what caused me to become a Zen Buddhist at that time. It's packaged so sweetly. Musicians, celebrities, movie stars. Right? And we are lured into it. Now, Pope Francis is a man devoted to God in all things. And the UK Telegraph said this, Francis is a Jesuit, and his long, arduous formation as a priest was founded on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. The Association of Jesuit co Colleges and Universities said this, to think that the leader of the Catholic Church is one who follows in the tradition of Ignatius, whose life has been devoted to finding God in all things. Now the God in all things referred here is not so much the God as we know him in the Bible. It's that spark of divinity that Thomas Merton was talking about. That spark in all things. Now, Ellen White had this to say in Great Controversy. Of them, ye shall be as gods, he declares, knowing good and evil, Genesis 3.5 of Satan. 
Spiritualism teaches that man is the creature of progression, that it is his destiny from his birth to progress even to eternity toward the Godhead. The throne is within you already at birth, inborn. Right? Now, what I want to say is this. The immortal soul, you shall not surely die, is the foundation that was laid. And the things that were packaged with it, your eyes shall be opened, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And they all direct one and launches one into the thinking, into the neural phenomena, into the, the ecstasy of thinking that the Godhead, the throne is within us. Now what is this masterpiece of Satan's deception? It was laid in Eden, a foundation only, but it was developed over time until it became his masterpiece. And that masterpiece is to lure us to thinking that we are God. So a lie in Eden has become truth, true meditation, experiential truth, where one discovers one's divinity. Now, why do meditators meditate in silence? in nothingness. The basic belief is this. Everyone has an inborn divinity, an inborn immortal soul. But we are distracted. Our monkey brain, they say, are full of distractions and worries. We are worried about our life, our wealth, our materialism. Uh, we are worried about 101 things. Our mind is not at peace. And so if we are successful in quietening it, in not thinking about anything else, nothing, in silence, in absolute silence, we will suddenly discover that immortal soul. And the greater, the more perfect your silence, the more perfect your divinity. Now, it's also very sweet and loving and inclusive. What they're saying is this, everyone has it. If I were meditating and I've discovered my divinity, and you haven't, but yet we both have it, and so we are one, still. It's very sweet and inclusive. Now, here's Father Thomas Keating. He succeeded Father Thomas Merton. And Father Thomas Keating developed something called contemplative, no, centering prayer. And he said this, after Vatican II, that's 50 years ago, the Catholic young people were flooding off to India because the Catholic Church in Vatican II accepted Hinduism and Buddhism as valid ways to the mystery of God. So the Catholics were flooding into India. And he said, we must develop something to bring them back. And so they took Lectio Divina, which was a Catholic prayer, meditative type, and fused it with Zen and fuse it with TM, and develop this thing called centering prayer. And here he's saying, three steps in centering prayer to become God. Listen to his words. The spiritual journey, centering prayer, the spiritual journey is the realization, not just the information, but the real interior conviction that there is a higher power or God. So far, so good. And then he said, or to make it as easy as possible for everybody, there is another capital O. So he's switching the word God to an other capital O. Now why is he doing that? He is holding up the other capital O as the God for everyone. Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Catholics, and whoever else. The other capital O. So it is a generic God for everyone. All right? And then he says the second step. To try to become the other, still a capital O. That is the process that he's uh, developing or developed, a teaching. And finally, the realization, the third step, that there is no other. You and the other are one. Have always been, always will be, you just think you aren't. The third step says this. In deep meditation, you, your divinity, your spark, and the divinity become so much one as to be there is no other. So indistinguishably one. <laughs> you are God, and God is you. Right? And 
What's more? Always have been inborn. Always will be. Never leave you. You're always saved. Once saved, always saved. Born saved almost. <laughs> and this they project as the love of God. And if you should think that God is not with you, you just think you aren't. You're mistaken. Do meditation. Do centering prayer. You will establish that knowledge, that mystical knowledge. Now, Ellen White said, the wine of Babylon. She said, these, in other words, these two, the immortal soul and Sunday and kindred heresies, right? The immortal soul is the foundation of spiritualism. Um, I, you must get that right. That's where the foundation is. Satan develops it over time into a masterpiece of deception. Now I ask you, today, when that lie has become truth, experiential truth, and people say, like Father Thomas Keating, and he's training like 40,000, 50,000 people a year, these people, when they feel that way in the neural phenomena, in the, the, uh, the phenomena that's happening in meditation, um, they experience God in their brain. Right? What they perceive as God, as their divinity. Now, can this deception become worse? Worse in the sense that, is there something worse than this conceptually? Now people say, a lot of things can happen and it'll be worse. But I ask the question, conceptually, can it get worse? Can you think of something worse? I can't. When man becomes God, it's not possible. So this, is, this has to be the masterpiece in the last remnant of time that even brings together the kings of the earth to Armageddon. Today, false meditation is turning Satan's lie in Eden into experiential truth. Now, only one body of truth directly repudiates the immortal soul and all its kindred heresies. And which is that? One body of significant truth. And that's the truth that the Seventh-day Adventist Church holds that Ellen White has written about. All other bodies of knowledge, not truth, are for the unity, for the immortal soul. So we stand as a single opposition. We have been raised as a single opposition, a body of truth. We have been called as Seventh-day Adventists to give the second angel's message. The, the grasping of the false practices of Christian contemplation and the clasping of the bond of sympathy in Sunday is the process that we are seeing happening right now. We have to raise our voices right now before it's too late. But as we know it, these philosophies and these thoughts are coming also within our church. And what is its purpose? Ellen White said, to convert even our church into Babylon. That's what the attempt is doing. So what we see is the, um, the, the lie going from error to masterpiece. It's going from foundation of spiritualism to Satan's realm, his domain of, of the earth, his dominion. It's his principality and power, his kingdom. His kingdom is only possible if he, if God allows him to coexist with God. It's a non-dual kingdom. All right? He has no other option because God is his life force. He cannot destroy God. Right? So his only option is coexistence. And that's what non-duality is about. So we must sharpen the second angel's message, make it more present. We used to say, that was 100 years ago, it's an error, and it's true. It was present truth at that time. Right? It's an error. When you die, you don't go immediately to heaven or hell. There's the resurrection and the judgment, so forth. Absolutely true. But now it's developed 
that lie has been developed into a masterpiece. It's deluding the whole world, even the kings of the earth. So our truth must be more present, must be sharpened. And the Bible says, God shall send them strong delusion. And let that not happen to us. And I want you to think about this one, the unpardonable sin. If you were meditating and you felt that God's presence, the divine, the divinity is already within you, although you're not converted, and as you meditate deeper, you felt that your divinity is merging one with God Himself. And when the Holy Spirit comes and tells you otherwise, and works upon your heart, you feel that you already have divinity. Would you be likely to listen to the true Holy Spirit? And if you negate the true Holy Spirit, what is the risk? You risk the unpardonable sin. So I can see that this masterpiece, as it spreads and finds its root in Christianity, in uh, therapy, in philosophy, in our daily life, that it will bring people to a point where they close probation against themselves. It's not about God saying, ready or not, here I come. It's about humanity closing probation against itself. Now, we talk about Sunday law, right? The Ten Commandments, holy, just, and good. Pure. Sunday, impure. When it comes together, that's non-dual. <laughs> right? Non-duality at a very high level, at church and state level, closes probation against humanity, by humanity. Now, the second angel's message is that message. We have to proclaim it, declare it clearly that people can make their choices, that we can make our choices. And as I study this, I am so much more uh, convicted that in my own life, I cannot afford not to differentiate between good and evil. I must differentiate it thoroughly. King Solomon said, Ask God to help him to distinguish between good and evil. And it pleased God. Right. So it has an impact on our lives. Until we do this, we cannot proclaim this message. Now, where is this in the Bible? Where is non-dual in the Bible? <laughs> Think about this. The lady is in church. Not hot, not cold. Not this, not that. Lukewarm. <laughs> huh? Right? Those who look, regard darkness for light and light for darkness. Non-dual. Can't differentiate. Won't differentiate. Even God works upon them. They will not differentiate. It is actually mingled. And in Zephaniah, and these are Zephaniah's words to Jerusalem and Judah. Zeph Zephaniah 1.7 says, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, and the day of the Lord is at hand. Now this is, the day of the Lord is at hand. Zephaniah 1.12 And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search, who? Jerusalem, with candles, and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will He do evil. The people in Jerusalem at that time, Jerusalem, the church of the end. The people's hearts say, God is perceived as the God who will not do good nor evil. That is a non-dual God. That is Bat Homet. That is a Braxis. There's more. Ellen White said that this reasoning would lead astray the mind. Now, she was talking about the Alpha of Apostasy at that point. But Alpha of Apostasy was pantheism. It has developed so much that it, pantheism was uh, characterized as energy, understood as energy. 
even speculated as gravity by Kellogg. But it has developed over time. And now, it is God. It's personalized. It's not just energy. It's personalized. It's God. Right? And she said, even of the Alpha, and as the Alpha is de has developed on, unto the Omega, it has the same characteristic. It's more mature. It's not different. Right? It's developed with the same characters into more mature, more powerful. It's not different. All right? She said this. That this reasoning would lead astray the minds of those who are not established upon the foundation principles of present truth. It introduces that which is not but speculation in regard to what? The personality of God and where His presence is. Has the people in Jerusalem, in relation to Zephaniah, changed the personality of God? Yes. God is the one who does not do good, nor evil. Changing God's personality and presence. Malachi 2.17 says this. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied Him? When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good. They weary the Lord with these words. Everyone that doeth evil is good. And it goes on. Everyone that does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. Not in their sight. In their sight as well, but in also in the sight of the Lord. And He delighteth in them. Or, oh, where is the God of judgment? In this case, if, they, if this is true, there is no God of judgment. And this hits directly at our truth, the sanctuary, investigate the judgment. Our truth is the only truth that stands against this heresy. Our second angel's message is the only truth against all other bodies of knowledge, not truth. And they are all for the unity and non-dualism. Malachi 4.5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, if you look at Daniel's prophecy, Daniel prophesied in the first segment came John the Baptist, the second prophet. Right? In the next segment of the same prophecy, 1844, comes Alan White. So who is Elijah the prophet? Alan White. And what's her message? Her messages are direct repudiation of all the non-dualism we're seeing everywhere. This is a precious message. It's a Seventh-day Adventist message. We are called for this. And now is the time. So at the end, the people of the world will gather around the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What we want them to do is to gather around the tree of life. <sighs> That's our mission. The three angels' message, or the third angels' message, is our love call to the people in Babylon. Love call to our enemies, where we are prepared to lay down our wealth, no buy, no sell our life at the risk of a death decree. It's a love call and it's the highest love that anyone can render to the other. So that is our message. It's not a frightening message as some people make it out to be. It's a message of infinite love. Now I'll end here. I'll leave these thoughts with you. Um, I have a website. It's called meditation-mindyourbrain.com. Uh, the sciences which you heard, the, uh, the thinking, the spiritual uh, information as well, it's all there. So go to it. It's got, I think, 20 days of information for you to, <laughs> to dig through. Yeah. Um, you can also YouTube me, uh, Yip Kokto, and you'll see some sweet little eight-minute videos. They are just a flavor. They're meant to direct you to the website. So I'd like to thank you very much. God bless you.